Hello and welcome to Space Continuum. Yeah, you heard that right, it's Space Continuum. That's us. Oh yeah. So, what we got here for you today is me, Lena, uh, does a lot of different things. I call myself Traveling Joe of all trades. Uh, I do have some uni studies to verify my claims to be quite kind of smart. Most of the times, you know, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm Colin, I'm a writer, I write stuff, uh, mostly fantasy and science fiction and weird fiction, and I'm also a massive book geek, which you kind of have to be. But Same here. Yeah. And basically we are going to geek out about books, mostly about good books that um, subvert norms, but also about stuff we just like, yeah. and um, drink port. Yep. Well, today we're drinking port anyway. Exactly. Cheers. Cheers. So where do we start? So I think the idea was that today we'll talk about the books that define us the most, the books that are our our bloodline, what's it called? That quote by Thomas Mann. Books are the arteries of the soul. Exactly. Yes. So which books do we have in ourselves? Where do we start? Oh. The top top three maybe? Top three, absolutely. Yeah. And we could go for other author as well as single titles. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it would kind of hard. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do you want to start? Oh I can start. Should we go one by one? Yeah, yeah, one by one. Okay, so my biggest uh crush or um, the author that I am quite an award with and can't let go of is of course Octavia E. Butler. I keep coming back to her in every instance of my life. I've written my bachelor thesis about her. Partially, uh, and she's my one-stop uh, author for high-quality science fiction, with a good sense of criticism, uh, important issues. That's kind of hard to formulate, but she's everything you need from one author, basically. Mm -hmm. I would say. So, <clears throat> uh, one of the writers that have influenced me the most and I love to bits and will for all my life is Ursula Le Guin. Who has I've um, followed her books from when I was a, from since I was a child uh, and read um, The Left Hand of Darkness and uh, Wizard of Earthsea until present day and um, just like Octavia Butler is your one stop shop for for stuff so is Ursula Le Guin for me um, yeah 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 all right so on my second place. I would say, oh, this is a bit harder actually. Octavia E. Butler is always my, yeah, I can always pop that one out. But yeah, I love Octavia Butler. But the second one, I think, would have to be Neil Stephenson. These are all like the best seller names, I know this. But Neil Stephenson is the one author I would immediately pick up his latest book and drop everything else. I've dropped university courses because of Neil Stephenson's books. Wow, good uh, song. The Brock Cycle. Uh -huh. Yeah, yes, you start reading one and you get stuck forever. It's, it's a good psychology course, but it's better reading Neil Stevenson. Mm -hmm. uh, I find the scope of his books to be amazing. They're quite intricate. Well, at least there's a lot of stuff happening, and he leaves it together quite well, uh, really well, <laughs> I would say. And I haven't read a book of him that's not great, except maybe his very first one, but he's kind of like suits himself there as well. <laughs> uh, so definitely Stevenson. Mm. I wouldn't say there's a, there's a lot of... There's two different things I get out of Kava E. Butler and Neil Stevenson. From Neil Stevenson is the craft, and his amazing storytelling and the very complex stories. While Kava Butler it's mostly the ideas, I would say. So they're two giants for me, but in different ways. Mm. That's a good one. Thank you. Yeah. I think for me the second one would have to be Torbe Jansson. Oh, yeah. that's right. I know. Uh, that's very cute of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, what I find um, interesting is that um, her stuff is marketed as being very cute and for children. Mm. 
when in fact a lot of our stuff is very, very dark. And um, in fact, as a child, I was terrified of most of her stories because they were so dark and so scary. The characters are quite scary as well. Oh, them. yeah, absolutely. Mm. Uh, but I think I needed them. Um, I think children do need dark stories. And Tove, she understood that need and she gave it to, to them pretty much. And I've found um, them to be even more fulfilling to read as an adult, uh, especially her novels. Yeah, um, I got them first book. Oh my god, you haven't? Yeah, no. What have you read? Oh, I read Nathim, so it took all my time. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> okay, so what's your third one? Oh, I thought I was just thinking about that one, because mm -hmm. that one's really hard. Um, so many. I would have said Joanna Russ, mm -hmm. definitely. Mostly, I never found an author as angry as she is and able to put it into wor words. Mm -hmm. uh, I love her essays primarily uh, about everything, about women writing, about the. If, basically, about. Well, she writes from a second wave feminism angle, and everything she writes is fantastic. It's so filled with anger in a very righteous way and very humorous as well, that I find very, very impressive. And I like her stories as well. I'm not attracted to reading her stories, because they're so hard to read usually, mm. but I always get quite a lot out of it in the end. It's more like going for that exercise you really know you need, but you don't want to go, but afterwards it's fantastic. That's Joanna Ross for me, reading her novels and short stories. I love how she is so entertaining at the same time. Yeah. As in, she, I have never seen an author be so angry and so funny at the same yeah. time. Do you remember the, the short story with, um, I think it's called The Attack of the Clichés from Outer Space? Oh yeah, I told me, I haven't read it yet. I have it, but oh, I haven't read it yet. It's brilliant. It's about this, this author who finds a haunted typewriter. Her, her typewriter becomes haunted by clichés and she has to type them out <laughs> in order to exercise the typewriter. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very funny. Mm. One of the early like, out lesbian writers as well. Mm. So who's your third top pick? Um, this one is really hard. Um, I think that one of the writers who has been most important to me uh, as a teenager was Neil Gaiman. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and this is a big but, uh, only his graphic novels. Oh yeah. yeah I was yeah. never a huge fan of the prose, but the graphic novels, The Sandman and The Books of Magic have been tremendously important to me. Yeah. And the way I view the world, um, pretty much that the world is built on story, and mm -hmm. uh, the way the world of the imagination works, the way... I, sort of, he taught me how to kind of tap into my own dream world and that's use that for storytelling. That's quite fantastic. Yeah, I understand it is. Yeah. yeah. So I'm thinking, are the main difference between us two Mm -hmm. I mean, that is that you're a writer, and I'm not a writer. How do you think that influences the choice? Uh, do you think, because mm, me as a non-writer, is thinking, do you look primarily at other authors at their writing and compare it, have some kind of relationship? Do you see it from your own writing, or can you read books uh, purely as a reader? No, no, I cannot. I, it's. I, these days, I absolutely cannot read a book without thinking of it, um, without thinking about the craft, um, without thinking about it as a as a writer. Either, either it's oh, I wish I could do this. Like when I read um, China Meals, The Last Days of New Paris, yes. I was yeah. like, I could never do this. I might as well just, I might as well just go home and <laughs> hide under a blanket and never no. write a word again. It was that good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Um, or it's the, I see what this person is doing, I might be able to get some ideas from this, or what the hell is this person thinking, I could do this so much better. Oh yeah. So yeah. it's, you, I have these writer glasses on that I find it uh, very, very difficult to take off. Yeah. yeah. I have yeah. other friends as well who yeah. write. I, I wouldn't want to live there. The mm. ability to just read books for the, like a reader, mm. primarily. I know. Actually, I had I had an experience. Well, I do get get a I get the reader experience from some authors, like yeah. Charles Stross. Oh yeah. His laundry files. Yeah. Um, is it called the laundry? Yeah, files? yeah, laundry files. 
Trust Archives and Right. Yeah. Brilliant books. Um, funny. Yes, extremely funny and Very not British. always. Yeah, extremely <laughs> British, yeah. and you can just tell that he loves doing this. Yeah. Uh, and to me, it's just I can eat them like popcorn. Ah, that's cool. Yeah. So books like that, I can sort of put my writer glasses aside and just eat eat the literature. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. But I think when it comes to literature, there's either um, just out there yeah. like Mayville or Janssen and stuff. Yeah. It's really hard to just absorb it. It yeah. makes me want to uh, pick out the good bits and use them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. What about you as a reader? Do you have any, do you wear any glasses when reading? I think so. For me it's basically, I think those glasses stems from my political views, mm -hmm. so to speak, in my analysis of the world. I'm very, I wouldn't say sensitive, <coughs> but my threshold for <coughs> boring, heteronormative writing is kind of low. Uh, I do like some of those orders as well, but it has to be really good to mm. be able to get over that. Mm. But I prefer some kind of literature that deals with these issues uh, consciously mm. and not just... Because well, it feels... Because you can't write something that's detached from the society, basically, mm. and trying to, it has to be quite well written to have a value of its own outside of dealing with the world, so to speak, you know yeah. what I'm Yeah, you can't yeah. just detach from yeah. issues in the exactly. world. Exactly. No, absolutely. Because I've noticed that I start, st stopped reading quite a lot of the new stuff. I work in a science fiction bookstore, and I kind of stopped reading a lot of the new books Mm. Uh, the last couple of years, because I'm so tired of some of the things. Like, it's pretty good stuff coming out, but it doesn't really contribute to anything. Mm. I want, you know, I, I think I want primarily now to read books as part of the great conversation. Mm. And I had one great reading experience this summer that was above and beyond, and that's Ada Palmer's Do You Like the Lightning? Mm. It really blew my head off, because it's, it's a debut novel. It's a quite a, it's not an easy read. It's kind of... Like each page took quite a lot of time to read. I'm usually a quick reader, but it was <coughs> satisfying and was interesting. There's a lot of layers in it. Mm. It's a, it, it builds a really interesting world, and I haven't experienced that in a really long time. So that gave me some renewed hope. For like, well, maybe I should just get out there a bit more and read some new titles. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I have this project that I want to do, which is read more post-colonial science fiction. Yeah, yeah. I'm down with that. We have gay chips. Uh, I've been reading um, a lot of short stories by uh, Rushita Lonan Ruiz, <coughs> and also some short stories by Aliette Bodar. Yeah. Oh yeah. I have. I've read her, but I've seen the books and. Oh yeah. yeah. Brilliant stuff. I've been hovering around them. <laughs> yeah. So we should totally make one of these episodes about post-colonial science fiction. Maybe next episode then. Yes. Let's go post-colonial in space. In space. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's a cat. Do uh, you want me to put her up? No, it's cool. Okay. I have medicated. Okay. Hi, cat. Kitty medication. What's the name of this cat? Uh, it's Keiko. Keiko? Yeah, Keiko. Keiko, meet camera. <laughs> no, no. Not. Keiko no. wants to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what other subjects do we do we want to do? I want to do mental illness. Oh yeah. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, I want to anything that's uh, dealing with normative behavior, mm. using science fiction as a crit social critique is open for me. Mm. Um, um, I would like to get into space conversation, how that is a rep reproduction of conversation on Earth, mm -hmm. and how it's always talked about as something positive in a lot of science fiction, even from the 70s. Like a solution for problems on Earth, like oh, this as long as we got new new Earth, new more space, other worlds, everything will solve itself. Which is basically just a repeat of you know the old world mm. colonizing the new world. Mm. But that's basically that could be stuffed into the post-colonial. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. definitely. Uh, well, obviously, I want to do queer as well. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And we could do several different iterations of queer as Yeah, because well. yeah. this is a very broad spectrum. Mm. So, this whole podcast started because me and Karen held a talk 
in front of people at the Pride Festival in Malmö this August uh, under the heading Queer Space Attacks. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And we did. Yeah. Mm. It was nice. And it was very fun. And I loved reading mm. up on stuff for it. So this is why we're doing this podcast. So we can keep going, talking about good stuff and getting to know new authors, new titles, yeah. more texts. Yeah, because people came up, insisted on coming up to us after the uh, after we did our thing, and they wanted more. Yeah. And uh, including this cat is licking my hand. She's very friendly. <laughs> <laughs> she um, wants you to pet her. <laughs> oh. Uh, and they also said we should do a TV show. Yeah. So here we are. Here we are. We're getting down with the YouTube generation. Yeah. That's the most old latest thing I've said in a long while. <laughs> well, yeah, it's then that's part of the charm with us, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's why we have the talk. Yeah. Yes. Cheers. 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 So, what have you read lately? What are you reading right now? Oh, I'm not reading anything at the moment. Mm -hmm. I haven't read a lot of stuff. I did read uh, two of the most hyped books of the Swedish um, book. Um, few new titles this autumn. Uh, that was really interesting, but but they both focused on quite a heteronormative relationship and how to subvert 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 things within the context rather than changing the context. Mm. And they were non-fantastical, so it's like they're good, but mm, no special effects. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hi. They, for some reason, the camera turned itself off. Yeah, but we're back now. We're back. How are they? This is a parallel dimension. Ooh. A glow cloud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you read stuff that didn't have any special. Yes. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Like muggle books. Muggle basically. books. Yeah, muggle books from the bestseller yes. thing. It was interesting, mm. but I'm longing for my my other books. I've had quite a long stint of uh, reading quite a lot of seventies sort of the news uh, soft wave mm. uh, science fiction written by women primarily. Mm. Um, so I'm going to get back to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have, um, I was, I just finished reading Elizabeth Hand's Wilding Hall. Oh yeah. Have you read that? No, I haven't. Oh, it's I'm really looking for it. It was just an e-book, right? Yeah. So yeah. Wilding Hall. Yeah. Uh, which is about um, a prog rock band in the 1970s who show up at this old, old mansion in the English countryside to record an album Ooh. and weird stuff starts happening. Oh, lovely. Yeah, and Elizabeth Hunt, she does this so well. Um, she does the English countryside so well in the mythology. It's quite reminiscent of, um, do you remember Mythical Woods? Oh, I've read that one. Oh. One of the friend's uh, favourites. Yeah, so brilliant. It's on my to read list, but I haven't. You know, I can't remember much of it. I um, I only remember the feel because it's must be twenty years since I read it, but oh, yeah. it's absolutely brilliant as far as I remember it. Yeah. But I am I am so in love with um, the idea of the English magical countryside. I'm an Anglophile. Yeah. I was um, traveling around the British Isles a couple of weeks ago, and decided I would you know drink tea, um, drink stout, eat pub grub and only read stuff that takes place in England. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Very good idea. Yeah, yeah it worked out fairly well. <laughs> and I have, I mean, I have a to-read list that is a mile long, but one that I'm preparing to read is uh, Bestiorium by Mary Kander. Oh, oh, that was lovely. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love everything by Mary Kander. I don't know if she's been translated to, to English. I think one or two books. Um, her last name is spelled K-A-N-D-R-E, and you should definitely look her up. She is um, what you could actually call uh, one of Sweden's very few authors of weird fiction. Yeah, oh yeah, that's true, yeah. yeah. She was a little bit enfant terrible as well, mm. you see. Like a, she came from the punk scene as well, into a quite literary field as well. Mm. Uh, it's very special. Some are more social realism, others are very weird indeed. Yeah. She has this woman and Dr. Freud, Dr. Droif. Droif, yeah, Droif. Oh, yeah. Woman and Dr. Droif, that's fantastic. Mm. And her in short circulation, like semi lyrical, and mm. God, the Garden, Garden Devil, it mm. was called. Mm. It's amazing. I found that when I was in uh, secondary school. Mm. I was just blown away. Basically, about God and Devil going around in the forest, and God is this bull and this little shit. And Devil is 
soap it out and try and do its best all the time. Nothing it does helps. Good stuff. It was fantastic. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm preparing to read some stuff because I'm going to be on a panel at Eurocon in Barcelona mm -hmm. about um, weird fiction around Europe. Mm -hmm. So I figured I should read up on Scandinavia. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. So the Finns have a good weird scene. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, in Sweden it's a bit harder to grasp. There are some writers out there who... Like write, you. Yes, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like you. <laughs> but um, there aren't a lot of writers, out, writers in Sweden who can be said to write weird fiction. Yeah, that's true. But there's Marikander, I would, um, I would invite her to the weird fiction tea party. Yeah, definitely. And possibly Tolv de Lindgren. Oh yeah, I haven't read anything. You haven't? Right. No, I haven't. No, his stuff is, um, it's classified as magical realism yeah. a lot of it, but it has a definitely weird feel to it. Yeah. I had a friend who lives in, uh, was from the Philippines, mm -hmm. asked me about the Pulu Sun, that's been translated in Swedish. It's like, is this really uh, into English? Mm -hmm. uh, is, is this really a thing? He's like, well, what can you tell me about Sweden? <laughs> like, what did you read? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Now, his, his stuff takes place in the fictional northern Sweden, where things are just, just a little bit odd. I should read it. Yes, you yeah. totally should. At least his short stories definitely yeah. do. Yeah. You yeah. can borrow one of mine. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, this is perfect. Excellent. Yeah. I'm trying to read a bit more of Swedish now. Mm -hmm. back, I've been reading in English so far, uh, so long. I'm trying to get back into mm. yeah, Swedish text. Mm. So I don't lose the sense of what's correct and what's not correct. Mm. Mm. Now I'm starting to lose my ability to have one language to match fluent in. <laughs> but you used to be like a billion languages now. Yeah. But for each language I read again. So for each language that I study, I lose a little bit of my native tongue. Because mm. I found this, uh, sometimes I find this thing in the other language that's so much better in Swedish. Mm. I just integrate that into my brain. Where are we? Um, I could ask you, what are you preparing to read? I'm preparing to read now. I would like to read from my giant pile of books to be read. How high is your giant pile of books? It's basically that size, perhaps. Uh, it's quite a lot. <laughs> Um, what you can't see is that there's an entire bookcase of books that apparently Lena is about to read. Perfect. Some of them. Yeah, some of them. Yeah. It's here that, yeah, I have some books that are on my to read list that are like 20 years old. Mm. So, but what I would like to read soon is either Nicola, 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 Nicola Griffith, uh, Ammonite. Ooh. Look at that one. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps one of my Joanna Russes mm. or some Connie Villas. Depends on my feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this is definitely something of my favorite female authors. Sounds good. That's basically it. And you? You had yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm reading mm. that, and then I I think I'll be reading a book called Texas Whiffer. Oh yeah, Björn Sivilund. Yes, Björn Sivilund. Urban fan, no, Western weird ish. Exactly, yeah. Western weird. We like Western weird. Yes, we do. Do we? Yeah. yeah. We'll have to give us a report in the oh, next yeah. episode. Absolutely. Before they put Western and postcolonial is kind of fitting. Mm hmm. Oh yeah, the frontier. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, the frontier. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. So I think that's us. Uh, that's it for us yeah. today. Signing off for today. Yes. Hope you like this as much much as we did. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>